Hi and welcome back. We left off on the last video, California Highway 14 Attractions. Here's the thumbnail if you want to go back and watch the beginning of this trip. And now we're leaving the Ricardo Campground in Red Rock Canyon, traveling north on Highway 14 about 10 miles to the little sign that says Burl Schmidt Tunnel. And that's on the right hand side heading north. Uh, once you turn right onto the dirt road off of the 14, you'll make an immediate left and you'll travel along the 14 for just a bit. And then you veer to the right and head out into the middle of nowhere. And it's about 11 miles to the tunnel entrance. Now this road is for the most part pretty decent. I do have a, a 4x4 so it made it really easy. I think any high clearance all wheel drive vehicle could make it except for the parts where you get into the washes. You have to look for these little burned out signs that point you in the direction because there are quite a few Y's in the road. And yeah, anyhow, a lot of whoop de doos a lot of really bank turns because this is mostly an OHV uh, type track. I'm pretty confident a two-wheel drive pickup truck or SUV that's got some good clearance could make this trek with no problem. You just gotta be careful of the washes. Along the track, you'll come across some subtle and not so subtle markers pointing the way to the tunnel. Here's a fun fact. My entire trip out, back, and even the time I spent hiking through the tunnel I did not see a human being or another vehicle. <laughs> Here's a very helpful hint. Before you hit the dirt road off of the 14, set your Google map to Schmidt's Tunnel. And as long as you don't turn off Google Maps app or don't turn off your phone, it will get you there and it will get you back. Because about a mile onto the dirt road, Mobile service comes and goes, but it mostly goes. <laughs> so if you leave it on, it'll take you there and it'll take you back to the 14. Driving along this track, you will come across some like, I think they're like just like four by four vertical posts in the ground. And if you look closely at it, it does tell you, uh, well, here's one right here. It'll say Schmidt tunnel and at the bottom of the words there'll be a little arrow pointing in the correct direction so keep a lookout for those and as I mentioned earlier there you will cross some washes and in those washes because of recent rains and blah 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 you get really soft what I always call sugar sand and you can kind of see it and as long as you keep your speed up don't brake and don't accelerate through it you won't get stuck but if you slow down and stop you and you hit the gas you're stuck so for non 4x4 vehicles, cruise through those washes with some good speed going. You can see it coming, so just speed up a little bit. All right, this was quite a fun little road, I have to say. And I would say also the last two miles was probably the most treacherous because you're heading straight up a hill. Anyhow, we're arriving now at uh, Mr. Schmidt's cabin. Here's a photo of William Schmidt in his later years. He spent 38 years living on the mountain while digging through it. <laughs> Here's a picture of his cabin throughout the years. It's just uh, not much left there now and all kinds of signs saying do not enter and to stay out. But the interesting thing was he used he reused, upcycled everything, like the metal from his kerosene jugs he used as siding on his house. Inside of his cabin is just full of newspapers, magazines, uh, food packages. That's what he used to insulate the walls. It's almost like a time capsule there of all kinds of interesting artifacts. This article kind of explains it all. Burl Schmidt's one-room shanty remains standing a short distance from his tunnel. It is a rare time capsule of American history, largely preserved as it was some 80 years ago. Thanks to the desert conditions and the caring stewardship 
of the late Evelyn Tawny Sager, who, with her husband, purchased the site in 1963. However, the cabin has been neglected and ravished by vandalism since her death in 2003. Here's an aerial view and the direction that we entered the area where his cabin is. And then over here is where the tunnel entrance is. After visiting the cabin area, I would stop and listen to see if you have any vehicles coming because this area there to get you to the tunnel entrance is kind of uphill and full of blind curves. So you want to make sure no one's on coming. If you remember earlier in the day, I put some frozen food in my car crock pot cooker. And now that we're approaching the tunnel entrance, I'm going to eat before I hike that tunnel. Back on Memorial Day weekend, my mom and I made a huge batch of homemade meatballs and gravy. And yes, we call it gravy, not sauce. I don't want to get into it. In my family, it's gravy. So since I'm going to hike this tunnel, I thought I'd have a good last meal in case I don't make it out alive. Mm-mm-mm, <laughs> was that good. Anyhow, here's the plaque at the entrance honoring old Schmidt. And this is the tunnel entrance. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Just to be fair, the first 10 to 15 feet is a very small opening and then it opens up to where you can actually stand up with no issues hitting your head. The average tunnel height is six feet tall and 10 feet wide, except for the entrances. <laughs> They're really small. All right, let's learn about Mr. Schmidt. William Henry Schmidt was born in Rhode Island, January 30th, 1871. As a young man, he was frail and small of stature. Six of his brothers and sisters died from tuberculosis. He was expected to face the same fate as his siblings unless he moved to the West with its hot, dry climate. 23-year-old Schmidt came to California in 1894, a year before the big gold strike above the Fremont Valley. He prospected around Kern County and eventually established claims and then the remote interior of the El Paso Mountains near Last Chance Canyon. The canyon was known to travelers before Schmidt's day. Some 40 years earlier in February of 1850, William Lewis Manley passed through on his escape from Death Valley. In 1906, the same year as the Great Quake in San Francisco, Schmidt started mining, boring horizontally into the 4,400 foot mountain in the El Paso. Very quickly, he encountered the solid bedrock, bulletproof gray kern granite. He must have encountered a couple veins of gold early on, or at least produced ore that essayed well because he kept at it tunneling deeper into the mountain. It's hard to see it in the video, but just the light on my GoPro gives me plenty of light to walk, but it's really dark in the video. A successful mining operation depends on several factors. First, there must be a worthwhile body of ore that will allow itself to be separated from the surrounding rock. Secondly, a transportation infrastructure must be available to convey the ore to a processing or distribution facility. Coming up is one of the spurs off the main line here. And you can see the tracks from the ore carts that he used. And this is a entrance and it's even got a door on it. I wonder if he found a vein of gold and was following it. Let's just go and see how far this goes. Well, looks like that's the end <laughs> so maybe this is where he stored his ore carts when he was busy working on the ranches during the heat of the summer because this door here would shut and it looks like there's a latching mechanism or a locking system here but i guess we'll never know mojave is about 20 miles to the south and was the local transportation hub at that time. The Southern Pacific Railroad had been there since 1876. 
Closer were the mills of Garlock or those in the young mining town of Randsburg. Schmidt's dilemma was that no roads, only scant trails were available in the El Pasos. His primary route of travel, like Manley's, was through the Last Chance Canyon. There had to be a better route, thought Schmidt. This was a time of building, a period of great ideas. Work had already started on the Panama Canal and talks were of building a gigantic pipeline from the Owens Valley to bring water to Los Angeles. Unfortunately, I'm not a rock hound and have no idea what that was, but I'm gonna call it gold. How's that sound? <laughs> Schmidt knew the only routes out of the mountains was to move his gold through either a treacherous canyon or to tunnel through the mountain to the flatlands, giving him easy access to Garlock or Mojave that lay on the other side. So that's what he did. Schmidt had no formal training in either prospecting or mine construction. He didn't use any of the standard mining tools of the day, which would have included compressed air drills and jacks. Instead, he used only a pick, a shovel, and a four pound hammer. Wow. And this is on granite, which is just ridiculous. As he pounded through the rock with his pick, the broken rock was carried out first on his back and later in wheelbarrows. Schmidt would eventually install iron tracks and a mine car to transport debris out of the growing tunnel. Later, after the mine and tunnel were well underway, he began to use dynamite, again without a lick of experience or training. He came to the conclusion that short fuses saved money and would run out of the mine like a jackrabbit being chased by a coyote and throw himself to the ground to avoid being struck by the force of the blast and the debris every time he lit the fuse. On multiple occasions he showed up at neighboring mine camps injured indicating he either cut the fuse too short or hadn't run fast enough. <laughs> Schmidt lived a solitary and frugal existence in the high desert. His only companions were a pair of burros, Jack and Jenny. The locals named him Burro Schmidt. His clothes were patched with flour sacks, tin cans were pressed into the soles of his shoes, an old cast iron stove purchased secondhand cooked his meals and heated his one room cabin, which was insulated with old magazines. Two of his favorite meals were supposedly Aunt Jemima pancakes and fish chowder made from sardines, rice, and boiled onions. When he could afford it, Schmidt burned kerosene in his lamps. When kerosene became an unattainable luxury, he used candles, but limited himself to one two cent candle each day. He survived numerous cave ins during the excavation of his tunnel. Fortunately, the shaft ran through solid granite because all indications are that he was too cheap to have purchased the timbers to properly shore up a less stable tunnel. Work progressed slowly. At some point in time, the tunnel mutated from a project into an obsession. Schmidt would get a job during the hot summer months on the Kern River ranches in order to generate income to support his digging. In the 1920s, a good road was constructed allowing an easy downhill route into the desert through Lower Last Chance Canyon to the Dutch cleanser mines at Kudahay Camp. This good road connected to the rail line in Mojave in 1909. Schmidt was in his 50s, and for most folks, this would have been reason enough to stop tunneling and get on with mining. At last, Burl Schmidt could safely transport the fruits of his labor. It looks like we have another spur off the main line and those rocks on the ground from my Indian camp days are telling me this is not the right way. So let's continue on because I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Here's where reality becomes weirder than fiction and what makes Schmidt so perplexing as a human and legendary in his time is that he just continued doing what he decided he was going to do, digging his tunnel. He is an example where reasoned, rational intent does not conform to logic, like a crazy soup sandwich. 
By the time Schmidt saw daylight at the opposite end of his tunnel, he was 67 years old. The year was 1938, and he had worked on his tunnel for 32 years. The tunnel was nearly 2,500 feet in length. That's just about a half a mile. It's pretty cool to experience the actual light at the end of the tunnel. And just like the other entrance, well, I got really short at the end there. Oh. And here we are in the beautiful valley. To the left would be Randsburg, way out there in the distance. And even farther to the right would be Mojave. Whenever I travel, I keep on me the Garmin InReach Mini 2. It's a satellite tracking device. And it also leaves a breadcrumb trail so my mom can follow me. This is what it looks like. I just clip it on my belt, but the best part is it has this SOS button. And that, if I press that, anyone can come and rescue me. It's pretty awesome. But what I wanna show you is the trail through the Schmidt Tunnel. It Okay, so here's where we came into the tunnel at, and this is where we came out at. And that's just about a half mile. This is what the GPS tracking tagged me going in the tunnel and out of the tunnel. And here's an overview. Each dot is a 10 minutes period of where it tags the trail. That way my mom can see where I'm at at all times. <laughs> I'd be kidding myself if I didn't say I was a bit anxious when I entered the tunnel, so I just kind of hoofed it to the other side to get out just to check it out. So I'm not going to bore you with a walk all the way back, but I am going to stop and look at a couple of the things I passed a little bit closer, especially that last spur that was right by the exit. I want to go check that out. So here we go. Like I said in the beginning, the entrances are pretty short and small. It's kind of strange how the rest of the tunnel is great. But I can say this, it was 98 degrees out when I entered the tunnel and it ended the tunnel. I'm not sure of the temperature, but it was super cool and beautiful. I definitely feel more relaxed walking back through the tunnel than I did coming in. Oh, check it out, there's life here. Ooh, a mouse. Hey, mouse. Did you see the mouse? Here it is in slow-mo. That was pretty awesome how he kind of just slithered into that crack. <laughs> wow. A mouse in the house or the tunnel. Okay, we're coming up to that other spur. And I would say for the most part, there's not been much trash, really. But I'll pick that up on the way out. It's looking pretty deep. And it was right at the exit or entrance however you want to call it i wonder what made him make this turn i don't see any cart tracks so i wonder if he was mining at this section after he opened it up on the other end and thought maybe i'll mine a vein here because it's close to the exit and close to the towns throughout this trek there was a lot of gold or orange spray paint and it's always near the goldy glittery stuff i think i'm gonna call that as a marking for gold <laughs> hey mom what do you think do you think that's gold <laughs> should i go back with my pick <laughs> anyway <laughs> as we get back to the main line we can get a last glimpse of the tunnel exit or the exit for me anyway fascinating Fast forward a bit to the first time I saw light at the other end of the tunnel <laughs> in the direction that we're going. For reference, the walk in the tunnel was a complete video. Did you notice there's no cribbing holding up the sides or the ceilings? A red W. Is that William Burrow Schmidt's own graffiti? Hmm. <laughs> That looks like a mouse nest to me. Hmm. All right, so let me repeat myself. Well, just a little bit. So he was 67 years old when he saw the light at the end of the tunnel. It was 1938. He worked on the tunnel for 32 years. The tunnel was 2,500 feet in length, which is just about a half a mile. And he had removed 5,800 tons of granite. As for the tunnel, 
He never used it to move an ounce of ore to Mojave or anywhere else. Oh my. And upon his completion, he sold the tunnel to another miner, Mike Lee, and moved elsewhere in the El Pasos. Hello! Hello! <laughs> Can't blame me for having a bit of fun now, can you? <laughs> William Henry Burrow Schmidt died in 1954 at the age of 83 and is buried nearby in the desert town of Johannesburg. He was quoted as saying, I never made a damn thing out of it. In a monetary sense, that statement may be true, but the irony is his tunnel bored through solid granite will probably outlast many of the other monuments men have created for themselves. Ripley's Believe It or Not named Schmidt the Human Mole and stated of Schmidt's tunnel that it was the greatest one-man mining achievement in history. Schmidt retained ownership in several other claims. The California Journal of Mines and Geology, April 1949, sold Schmidt as the owner of the Copper Basin Group of Mines, which was Oring Copper, and the Iron Hat Mine, which was Oring Gold. The Schmidt Tunnel and surrounding areas are in a bit of an ownership dispute. <laughs> ownership of land underlying a mine claim remains with the United States government under the management of the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, with only mining rights transferred to the mining claim owner Whereas no mining operations are underway, the BLM states that they own the Schmidt Tunnel and associated surrounding land because it's an unpatented mining claim under the General Mining Act of 1872. Meaning that all rights reverted to the BLM under the Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976. Upon the death of the grandfathered claimant, Evelyn Sager, who possessed the claim prior to 1976. This is in dispute, as Sager is claimed by her heirs to have maintained the claim legally under the terms of the Mining Act and properly transferred the mining claim upon her death to David Errors, her caretaker for the last years of her life. As of 2003, David Ayers and Mr. F. Schmidt claimed to be the legal owners of the mining claim containing the Schmidt tunnel. The historical buildings on the mining claim site were transferred by Tony Seeger's will to her granddaughter, Sherry Kelly. The BLM assumed ownership of the buildings via publication of abandonment notice after multiple attempts to contact then-owner Cheryl Kelly by both BLM personnel and private parties in order to preserve the site failed. According to the BLM, longtime caretaker David Ayers was offered the opportunity to sign a Memorandum of Understanding MOU with the BLM to be the full-time caretaker of the site, but refused to sign unless he was paid to be the caretaker and instead chose to leave to work elsewhere after being informed he had no legal right to remain at the site without the MOU. A small group of history buffs and the Friends of Last Canyon are actively preserving the site, but ongoing disputes about ownership of the mining claim and the historic structures continue to interfere with preservation efforts. As a result, Schmidt's cabin has fallen prey to vandalism and natural deterioration. It looks like the sun's getting ready to set and we got 36 miles once we hit the 14 to make it to Fossil Falls. Here's an example of one of the signs that tells you how to get back to the 14 if you can read it. So I really had to hoof it down this road because I don't like arriving in campgrounds after it's dark. And check out this desert sunset. Wow, this is amazing. And it looks like we're gonna make it to Fossil Falls Campground before it's completely dark. Just in time to see the SpaceX rocket launch which was pretty doggone cool. Burl Schmidt's tunnel has also appeared in the media. The second half of episode 509 of California's Gold with Yul Hauser, my hero, which was first aired in September 1994, 
is devoted to the Burl Schmidt Tunnel, and an episode of Roadkill aired, walking through the tunnel and giving its history. Well, I got camp all set up, and let me tell you, I am tired. <laughs> this trip will continue on in upcoming videos traveling north on California Highway 14 to California Highway 395, heading north towards Reno. Thanks for watching, and love you, Mom. Bye.